Hey everybody, Jeff Dunham and Walter. We just finished recording my very first podcast episode, so be sure to subscribe, like, and comment on my YouTube channel. And you can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok. If you're already watching this video on YouTube or Facebook, be sure to click to link in the description to stream or download the audio version from Apple, Spotify, or the podcast service of your choice. And as for our merchandise, tour updates, and all things Jeff Dunham, be sure to visit my website, jeffdunham.com. How's that, Walter? What the hell's a podcast? Hey everybody, welcome to the Jeff Dunham Podcast. I am Jeff Dunham and you have joined me for episode number 001. So to the fans, thanks for checking this out to see exactly what it is. And for those who have no idea what you just clicked on, stick around for a little while. I think you'll find something entertaining. And that's my goal for this podcast series, to entertain you and make you glad you tuned in. So for those of you who don't know, I'm a ventriloquist, and that's the only thing I've ever done for a living. So is this podcast going to be me with dummies telling jokes? Well, I may do that now and then, but for right now, who I want to talk to in these episodes are people who have stuck with doing only one thing for their entire lives. I want to talk to the people who have put 10,000 hours plus into their professions, but I don't want to hear only about their successes. Sure, we'll touch on that, but I'm more interested in what we rarely hear from these people. I want to hear about their failures. I want to hear where they screwed up or when life caved in on them and they almost didn't get up and keep going. I don't think we're ever going to find a successful person in whatever area of life who at some point didn't crash and burn right at the exit ramp of failure or quitting. You know, we always talk about success. Uh, when do we hear about the real teaching moments in life? And that's when you lose. So for this first episode, I didn't invite a guest. Instead, I want to tell you about my own 10-year journey to one of the biggest failures and screw-ups of my entire career, one that left me wondering if it was time to look for another job. So when I was in high school in the late 70s, the biggest late-night show, bar none, was The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson. He was the king of late night. There were only three networks at the time, uh, not even a Fox station, a couple of PBSs here and there, but that's about it. So uh, as a comedian, if you did well on The Tonight Show, your career was off and running. Everybody was watching that show. It was water cooler talk the next morning. That was it. Uh, a lot of comedians back from that time, that's how they got their start, was being on with Carson. Well, I had been a ventriloquist doing shows since the third grade, and I knew that was the only thing I ever wanted to do. We always ask kids, what do you want to do when you grow up? And I didn't have an answer up until the third grade. And I was also one of those unremarkable kids. I was terrible in sports. I was not popular. The girls didn't pay attention. I was not in the in crowd in the third grade. But then for Christmas that year, I got a dummy, started doing shows, and uh, I found a focus and I found a passion and kind of stuck with it. And I'd been doing shows forever. So when I graduated from high school in the spring of 1980, I set a goal, giving myself 10 years to make it uh, to performing my act on The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson. Seemed doable to me at the time. In the fall of 1980, I went to Baylor University and then finally graduated in the fall of 86, having changed majors a, a couple of times along the way. And I didn't change majors for career reasons. I did that because I kept failing math and foreign languages and I had to find a degree that didn't require either one of those things. So I finally graduated with a Bachelor's of Arts degree in radio, TV and film. And thank goodness none of those films were in French, if you know what I'm saying. I, I think... I think they finally just let me graduate because I'd proven to Baylor University that I could not pass a foreign language. I don't know if that counted or not, but somehow here I am. Anyway, during all those years, uh, during the college years, now and then I would venture out to Los Angeles for a week or so trying to get my feet wet in the real show business world, doing guest spots at comedy clubs and, and not doing great. Uh, back in Texas, doing Kiwanis Club shows and talent shows at Baylor, I, I was... You know, it was great. It was really good. But in Los Angeles, put me on stage at the Melrose Improv, and I died a thousand deaths. That was an industry room. It was a jaded crowd. They didn't care for the puppet show from Texas. But there was one club out here in L.A. that I did really well and because it was more of my kind of audience, my kind of club. That was the Comedy and Magic Club in Hermosa Beach, just south of LAX. Mike Lacey has owned and run that club forever, and he was really supportive of what I did. Uh, and the club was perfect because there was a spot for a variety act, which is what I was considered then. Uh, he'd have the opening, uh, the opener, and then the middle act, which would be somebody like me or a juggler or a magician, and then he'd put on the headliner. 
uh, and I did really did pretty great there. So, uh, but also uh, during my college years in '85, I dropped out of Baylor for two semesters to be in a Broadway show called Sugar Babies that was touring the country. Uh, I did my act six nights a week in a different city every single week for almost an entire year, and with all that performing, I got my act to the point that I thought it was it was pretty good. Uh, as did Mike when I went back in early 86 for a weekend at the Comedy Magic Club. And Mike said, you know, uh, I think it's time for you to audition for The Tonight Show. And I said, yes, it is. I was pretty confident because I'd been doing that my 12 minutes all over the place so often. And I thought the act was pretty tight by that point. So to the Comedy and Magic Club, Mike invited Jim McCauley. And uh, Jim was the booker for Carson's Tonight Show of all the stand-up comics. Many careers had been made because of Jim and because of The Tonight Show, and uh, a lot of guys also didn't like Jim because he wouldn't book them. Well, Jim came to see me and uh, that night at the Comedy Magic, and he left early. I walked off stage, and I said, Mike, what happened? Did, did he not like my show? And, and Mike said, oh, no, he liked it. He just leaves early because he has other clubs to go to, so don't worry about it. I said, okay, great. So the next day, I flew back to, uh, to Waco, and I started calling Jim's office. And got his secretary, and I said, hi, it's Jeff Dunham. Jim came and saw me this past weekend. Just uh, wanted to talk to him and uh, see what he thought. And she said, oh, of course, yes, I'll give Jim the message. I said, thank you. So you know how this dance goes. And it went on for days, all, a little over a week. I would call every other day trying to get Jim on the phone. And finally, uh, his secretary said to me, she said, you're, you're not going to give up, are you? I, I said, give up? No, I, I get it by now. He doesn't want me on the show, but I'd still like to talk to him about what he saw and what he thought. And she said, you know, hang on, I'll get him on the phone. Of course, Jim comes on the phone. He goes, hello. I said, hi, Mr. McCauley. It's Jeff Dunham. He says, oh, yeah. I said, I get it. You, you probably don't want me on the show, but I just wondered what you thought. And he goes, he said, Jeff, it's, it's really pretty simple. To be on The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson as a comedian, you have to be funny. And you're very good at what you do, but you're, you're just not funny enough. And I said, oh, that's it? He goes, that's it. Yeah, that's pretty much it. I said, oh, okay, so if I get funny enough, uh, will you come see me again? And, and he was kind of taken aback, and he goes, well, sure, I will. I said, okay. I said, again, thank you for coming to see me. I'll work on it. He goes, great, yeah, all right, so just work on it, and when you think the act is funnier, give me a ring, and I'll come see you again. I said, perfect, thank you very much. And that was that. Now, there was no reason for me mad at him. He was being very honest, and I, I, I took the criticism as more of a challenge than anything else, and I think it was because... Having gone out to Los Angeles so many times uh, during those years and performed at clubs out there, I realized I probably really wasn't ready yet because I was following guys like, uh, you know, like Jay Leno and Jerry Seinfeld. And these were guys that would just slay the room. And there I was up there doing my my little ventriloquist act. And I realized I really was that middle spot. I was a variety act. And I thought, if I'm going to be a, a headliner and get funny enough, I, I need to straighten things out a little bit. Instead of being a ventriloquist who told some jokes, I was going to need to be a stand-up comic who happened to use the ventriloquism as a vehicle for the comedy. So I kept doing my show over and over, all over the place, as many places as I could, trying to make it tighter and better and funnier. And two years later, uh, in September of 88, I moved out to Los Angeles. And I moved into one room. One room that I was renting from relatives of a friend, and that was all I had. I had 3000 bucks to my name, a Nissan Pathfinder, and a bunch of dummies in a box. But I kept doing shows, and I just happened to also have an agent that I had signed with a couple of years before, William Morris' agent, and he wasn't doing much except getting me you know, spots at comedy clubs around Los Angeles. And I kept practicing, kept trying to make it funny, and then finally, two months later, in early December, Lacey got me another audition with Jim McCauley. This would be my, my second audition with McCauley. So that night at the Comedy Magic Club, it could not have gone better. I mean, the audience was with me. Uh, everything hit on all cylinders. And after the show, Jim came backstage and he says, that was great. So you got the spot. I said, really? He said, yep. I said, that, that's great. Thank you very much. And he said one other thing. He said, but before you go on the show, I want to come back the night before here to the club and see you one more time just to give you a couple little pointers. If there's any jokes that wouldn't work for whatever reason with Johnny, we'll just make a couple of notes and a couple of changes here and there. Not a big deal. I said, that's fine. He said, congratulations. I said, great. He says, uh, call my office tomorrow morning and we'll give you the exact date. Thank you. 
And that was that. So the next morning I called and sure enough, they gave me a spot like a two or three days before Christmas. And uh, I called my parents. They got excited. We called all the relatives. Uh, I bought a really nice suit. I was in TV Guide. That was it. Then the night before the actual show came. And Jim came to the Comedy Magic Club, and Roseanne Barr happened to be there as well, working on her next Tonight Show spot, and Macaulay came to see her too. So she went up, and she did great, and I was next, and I was all excited. Got up there, and the audience wasn't quite on my side as much as they had been before, but it was still really good. And uh, I walked off stage, and Jim wasn't there. And I I said, Mike, where did Jim go? And he said, oh, don't worry about it. He said, "Uh, again, like I told you last time, he leaves sometimes. It'll be fine. And Roseanne, I I don't care what stories have been told about her. She could not have been sweeter to me. She was so supportive. She goes, she says, yeah, don't worry. She goes, "Uh, he leaves, but that was really great. You'll be fine. It'll be good. And I said, thank you very much. So I woke up the next morning pretty excited and I waited for business hours, then put in a call to Jim, got his secretary. And then she put Macaulay on the line. I said, hi, Mr. Macaulay, just uh, was uh, calling to see if you had any notes for me. And there was a pause. uh, And he took a breath and he said, Jeff, um, I made a mistake. I said, what? He said, "Uh, you're not ready. I said, I'm not ready. He goes, nope, you're you're just you're just not funny enough yet. So uh, I'm going to have to find someone to take your place tonight and you're not going to be on now that bit of news hit me like a boulder was dropped on my head I didn't really know how to take it I was silent and he added one thing and he said Jeff when it comes to being on the tonight show with Johnny Carson you have to remember one thing it's better to be five years late than one day early And even in that moment, that kind of made sense to me, but it was still a hard pill to swallow. And I thanked him and I said, I didn't quite give up. I said, but you'll come see me again? And he said, well, of course. Yeah. Just keep working on it. When you think you're funnier, give me a call. I'll come out and we'll look at you again. I said, okay, thanks. So, you know, up to that point in my life, I was 26 years old. Nothing really had bad had happened to me. I hadn't lost anyone close, but this was devastating. I mean, since my high school graduation, when I made that 10-year goal, every single day I had thought about how to make my act better and how to get on The Tonight Show. And then in the last two years, I had worked on making it as funny as possible, and I really thought I was there, but I wasn't ready. And then talking to my parents, uh, they didn't quite understand why I was that upset. So it was a kind of a lonely and sad time for me being in that one room all by myself. (laughs) I had died on stage before. Uh, Every comedian has, and there's, you know, that's pretty lonely and uh, pretty terrifying, but this, this was different. And then to add insult to injury, of course, that night I watched the tonight show to see who was in my place. And they had on a girl whose name was Merry Christmas. And she sat on the couch and talked to Johnny. And the only reason she was on was because her name was Merry Christmas. So I could have gotten angry. Um, It was just more sad than anything. Uh, Eventually, I did get angry, but not at Jim McCauley. I got angry at myself for thinking that I was ready. So I just kept working, doing more shows as many places as possible, trying to tighten the act and trying to make it funny. I figured out a formula for myself, and that was... I needed a laugh every 10 seconds. I watched other comedians on The Tonight Show, and the ones that did really well had six laughs a minute. So that was my math, and that's how I kept working on my own material and tightening the act. And I auditioned for Jim McCauley nine times. And eight times, I got, no, you're not ready, because you're not funny enough. But finally, on the ninth time, uh, this was now April of 1990, I was booked at the Ice House in Pasadena. And I called Jim, and my agent called Jim, and we finally talked him into coming out to see me. Now, the Ice House in Pasadena is an easy club. If you don't kill at the Ice House, you should not be a stand-up comedian. But he came that night. I did the show. I thought it went great, but I was out in the parking lot putting the dummies back in the car, and I thought, you know what? I don't know what was different than any other time. Uh, He's just going to come out and tell me no a ninth time. So Jim walked out the front door, and uh, he walked over, and he said, congratulations, you got it. 
I said, I got what? He said, you got to the Tonight Show. I, I said, I, I did? He said, yeah, that was really funny. You are ready. Call my office tomorrow and we'll give you an exact date. I could not have been happier. <laughs> it was finally the dream coming true again. And this time, I think it was for real. So, um, that day couldn't come any quicker for me. And I really was more prepared this time and I was more excited. And the night that they gave me, the show that they gave me, I mean, you, you, I couldn't have paid anyone for a better night. It was going to be on a Friday night. And if anybody remembers The Tonight Show with Carson, Friday night with Johnny, those, that was his favorite night. He said the audiences were best that night. And I have a sneaking suspicion that the Friday night audiences weren't really better, but they thought they were better because Johnny told them they were. But it was a Friday night, and then the other two guests, Bob Hope and B.B. King. How in the world did this happen? I'm going to be on a Friday night on The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson and Bob Hope and B.B. King. Couldn't have been better. So the night uh, got there and the afternoon got there and I was on stage, you know, looking to find my mark and they were showing me where the cameras were going to be and uh, making notes in my head. And Freddie de Cordova was the executive producer and he came up to talk to me. He said, don't you have another dummy besides uh, Peanut and Jose? I said, yeah. He says, it's an old man. I go, yeah, it's uh, Walter. He's out in the car. He says, oh, he's in the car. I said, yeah. He goes, he said, go get him. I said, for what? He said, just in case. I said, in case, in case what? He says, in case Johnny calls you over. And I, I'm sitting there thinking, in case Johnny calls me over, because I, I, I knew how this was supposed to go. As a stand-up comedian, you did not get to go to the couch and talk to Johnny on your first time. That had happened to like maybe three other comedians in the, in, in the history of The Tonight Show. But I said, okay, I'll do that. So I went in the car, got Walter, brought him, put him behind the couch. He says, yeah, leave him right there. That'll be fine. But I thought, there is no way in hell I'm ever going to get to the couch tonight. So the night, uh, that the evening came, and it was afternoon. They taped at 5 o'clock in the afternoon. And uh, I, I, I could not... I could not have been more excited. And I was a little bit nervous, but I knew that six minutes backwards and forwards. It was with uh, Peanut, Jose Jalapeno on a stick, and the, worm, the tequila worm in the bottle. And as I was standing there listening to Johnny Carson introduce me behind that curtain, it occurred to me, this was April of 1990, I had hit my goal of 10 years by two months. Two months later was my 10-year class reunion. So the curtain opened, and now it's all a blur. And I still get goosebumps talking about this right now. I walked out, and I did my time. And now I, I look back, and I kind of cringe looking at the tape. Uh, but at that moment in time, I, I couldn't have done any better. It was fantastic. And as my last joke went out, I got a big laugh. I took my bow. Nice round of applause. Big round of applause. And I was watching the stage guy. He was getting ready to, the stage manager was getting ready to wave me off and go behind the curtain. And instead, he went like this. And I went, uh, like, what? What? He says, yeah, go that way. And I knew what that meant. And I thought, I, I'm going to go over there to the couch to talk to Johnny Carson? What? You know, I was ready for my spot. I had been prepared. But no one prepared me to go to the couch and talk to Johnny Carson. I thought there was no way that was going to happen. I heard Letterman describe talking to Johnny Carson for the first time. like It's like talking to the guy in the $5 bill. What are you going to say? How are the kids? How is that going to happen? So I went over to the couch and sat down. And uh, over to my right was B.B. King. And there was Ed McMahon, Freddy de Cordova over there. This was the thing that dreams were made of for comedians. I fumbled around a little bit answering a couple of questions. And then Johnny said, do you have somebody else? Uh, isn't uh, you have another guy here? I go, oh yeah, this is Walter. He's, he's over here behind the couch. And so I pulled Walter out and uh, I said, Walter, you know where we are? And he goes, yeah, I don't give a damn. I said, but it's the Tonight Show, Johnny Carson on NBC. And Walter looks over at Johnny, looks back at camera and he goes, well, la di da And that got a nice big laugh. And then we went to commercial because uh, this was towards the end of the show. And during commercial, uh, I don't know <laughs> how in the world I did this, but I asked the king of late night uh, to do something for me. I, I said, Mr. Carson, uh, could you, at the end of the show here, when we come back, could you thank me for coming? I think I have a joke. And <laughs> Carson's like, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll thank you for coming. I said, thank you very much. So we come back from commercial. And uh, again, this is just a few seconds of what happened after that. But uh, again, this is one of my, my favorite moments 
in life. And uh, here is uh, here's what happened. Okay. We just have time to thank everybody. Jeff, good to see you. I hope you come back with us. Thanks, Walter, buddy. I hope you're in a little better frame of mind next time. I'll be a cold day in hell if I come back. <laughs> <laughs> so that was that. And um, uh, that moment right there. I mean, the, the spot on The Tonight Show was fun. Doing it with Peanut and all that was great. But it's that moment. People ask, are there any moments in your career that you look back on and I go, that was it. And, I, and you know what? That has to be the moment. Why? Because it was Johnny Carson. And again, there's a lot of people now who, uh, you know, never watched Carson. But at that time, it was, that was the pinnacle. And now that was the grade A stamp of approval for all of show business. That this guy went on The Tonight Show. He got to the couch. He did well. So afterwards, I uh, headed to my dressing room, packed up the dummies, and then my agent invited me to dinner. I don't remember where it was. It was some someplace uh, fancy. But we went to dinner, and I was just kind of killing time until I knew it had aired in Dallas because I was looking forward to talking to Mom and Dad about, about it and what they thought. And the time came, and I just happened to be driving up the 405. I picked up the car phone, called my parents. They both got on the phone at the same time, as they always did. I said, well, what'd you think? And remember, this is a, a very religious household, a strong Christian family. And also remember, Walter had said, uh, who the hell cares, and I don't give a damn. And there was this long silence, and finally Mom said, you know, Jeff, we don't approve of you using that type of language. I could have driven off the freeway in that moment. Uh, that was another huge disappointment to me. For me to have achieved at that time, my life's goal, and to have done so well, and to have been on top of the world, and most of us, we want to please our parents and get their approval. And for that to be the first thing she says to me, really hurt. I didn't want to talk to him after that. Um, and, you know, years later, mom apologized, and I understand. She was just still my mom, trying to be mom. But, and I was an only child, so I get it, I understand. But it just still kind of hurt. And I drove home, and I didn't know, nobody told me, because I didn't have many other comedians who were friends, or friends who were comedians, I didn't know you were supposed to go to the improv the night you do the Tonight Show for the first time, watch it with other comics, and then drink. I, I didn't know that. That's what you're supposed to do, go to the Melrose Improv. So I just went back to that one room and watched it by myself, and then turned it off. And then the phone rang. And it was my friend, longtime friend, Bob Rumba. And he was on the East Coast. And I said, hey, Bob. He said, hey, I, I watched it. It was great. I said, thanks. He said, what are you doing now? And I think somehow Bob knew what I was doing. I wasn't doing anything. Um, he said, it's kind of different now, isn't it? I said, yep. And what he meant by that was I had just been on top of the world. I had just done what I had dreamed of and had strived for and worked so hard for. And then a few hours later, I was alone by myself in a single room. Nobody to share it with. I guess if I learned anything from that, it's that I could have these goals and people can you can have goals and achieve them. But maybe this kind of goal is a little bit hollow and this kind of thing doesn't last forever. And maybe family and people are more important than just these achievements. But it certainly didn't take away from what I'd done. And I was very proud of it. And I kept pushing for years after that and had fun doing it. Um, I'd like to end this podcast with a piece from one of my specials from Comedy Central. It's from 2007, Spark of Insanity my second special with them. And this is where things led, uh, bigger and better and more fun. And this is just a, a few minutes with Walter on stage from Spark of Insanity. And I hope you enjoy it. You guys got another argument on the phone today, didn't you? Oh, you heard a little of that, that, did you? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I hung up on her. Not good, no. She called right back and she goes, did you hang up on me? I said, I don't know, it sounds something like this, click. <laughs> Thank you.
Did that make her angry? Oh, I felt a disturbance in the force. <laughs> you ever made it that mad when you're standing right in front of her? Oh yeah, what'd you do? Well, my mother always told me when you're in a jam and don't know what to do, you should think, what would Jesus do? Uh, so I tried to turn her into a fish. <laughs> So, that's Walter on stage, one of my favorite moments. Well, that's it for um, the Jeff Dunham Podcast, episode 001. Hope you enjoyed it. Hope you'll come back for some more. We'll have some guests. I don't know who it's gonna, they're going to be yet, but uh, we're going to have some fun. And the cool part that you're going to see is how we bring those guests on. It's like something I've never seen. I'm proud of it. I made it up myself. So, come along for the next one. And again, we'll have some fun. Thanks for joining me. See you next time.